So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Darren Haig from SAP. And what I'd like to share with you today is how SAP went from a pilot project doing DevOps a few years ago to today where we're running a whole DevOps platform on an OpenStack-based cloud. And what I hope you'll take away is the lessons that we learned along the way and some of the things we've done with OpenStack to make it a really awesome DevOps platform. So to start with a little bit about SAP, um, obviously we're a world leader in business applications. We've been going for many years now. And our vision is to help the world run better. More relevant to what we're talking about today is, as you see here, we've got 41 data centers around the world. An awful lot of users of our cloud software and a number of acquisitions to make us leaders in the cloud space in the last few years have given us 23 different cloud infrastructures. So you can see how it might be quite a good idea to try and really focus on just one of them. So I'm going to start by taking us back in time to 2010. And this is how we used to do things back then. You know, we thought we were quite good and we were reasonable at developing software in the IT department. Uh, we had good source control, uh, we had issue tracking, build automation, and these are all with the, the Atlassian suite that worked very well for us at the time. And we were doing monthly releases of our software. On the negative side, we had a month's lead time for new hardware. So if someone wanted to try a new project, they, they couldn't just sort of try it out. They had to fill in a whole bunch of forms, go through budget approval, and a few months later, if they were lucky, that hardware would be installed in the data center and they could actually start working on the project. We also had a really intensive quality cycle. So we actually had a dedicated team of guys who did a bit of automation, but a lot of the time they were just sort of clicking through web pages, checking that everything worked. And that took a lot of time and it was also potentially error prone. Uh, we also had another operations team next to the QA team, and every time we did a release, we'd do the typical job of throwing the code over the wall to the operations team, and then they would look up in their, their Word documents, their Excel spreadsheets, of all of the things they had to do to deploy that software and put in the right configuration values. And that was also prone to quite a lot of manual error. So structurally as well, we actually had the development team, the operations team, um, and the infrastructure team were all in completely different business units. So you had one guy running the physical hardware, one bunch of guys writing the software, and other folks in the middle who were busy trying to deploy that software onto the hardware. And there were just you know, different managers, and it's just it's a recipe for, for some confusion. And as I mentioned uh, earlier as well, the configuration data was typically kept in Excel spreadsheets. There was no real version control on that, no reviewing of any changes to configuration. So we did have this quite nice release cycle though. So as you can see here, we've got uh, four weeks cycle length and every four weeks we do some development. And then at the end of the development cycle, release that to the QA team for testing and then release to the operations team for deployment to production. So meanwhile, while that testing and de deployment is going on, the developers are carrying on with the next four weeks. So we're getting a you know, good monthly deployment of four weeks of solid work. Well, that's the idea. What we actually had was this. So in the first four weeks of a project, it's great. You do your development, hand it over to QA. Then QA start doing annoying things like finding bugs. And every time they're finding a bugs, they're handing it back to developers to fix, and developers aren't really getting on with the next release. And then when it's finally ready for release, we've got this error-prone manual deployment procedure that means we've got a day and a half of things being deployed, not quite right, people waking up in the middle of the night trying to fix it. And then you've got a development team trying to cram four weeks of work into two weeks while they're completely strung out after being up at midnight fixing the deployment. So faced with that, you might ask, why did we think of doing DevOps? Well, as well as that process which you had, you know, we were muddling along with that. We were delivering regularly, maybe just not as often or as much as we'd hoped. But we came to a point where we looked at the demand forecast in the IT department for the coming year. And we realized that, you know, with about 100 staff, that's roughly 20,000 person days of effort. And the demand coming in was for 60,000 person days of effort. 
and there's no way we're going to be able to get budget to hire another 200 staff. We couldn't even ramp up 200 staff in the time it would take. So, you know, doing what was demanded of us was impossible if we kept on doing it the way that we were doing it. So this is a theme that we'll return to a lot during this presentation, that it's all about the people. I'm going to talk about process, I'm going to talk about technology, they're helpful, but it's the people element that's critical and it just will not work unless you address that. So in our case, my boss, the, the chief architect, he promoted this book. Well, he did more than promote it. He basically said to everyone, get a copy of this book. Reading this book is a bonus relevant activity. If you have not read this book, you will not get your full bonus. So he really knew which levers to pull to get the whole team on board. But we all read this book and we, you know, it meant we all learned what needed to be done. And we started with just one small team uh, doing one pilot project. So we're not going to bet the whole farm on this immediately. We'll try one project and see how it goes. Meanwhile, his boss gave him cover to do this. So he basically arranged, you know, without necessarily telling anyone, to, to clip 10% from the other project budgets to, to fund this one. And you know, gave him cover, gave us time to actually work on this, you know, gave us room to fail without worrying about it. So this was the project we, we chose. It was the SAP ID service. So at the time, it was basically a single sign-on system. If you wanted to log on to any of SAP's different websites, it gave you one single account and, and seamless sign-on across them. Um, that was using, you know, had millions of users of SAP's web properties at the time. So that system needed to be reliable and stable or, you know, people can't access SAP's websites. And then later on in the product's life, we actually made it a, a customer-facing product as part of our cloud portfolio. So then it's using, it's the single sign-on hub for all of SAP's cloud software. So then it really has to be reliable. If this thing goes down, not only can no one get to SAP's website, they can't even get to their own software in the cloud. But as I just mentioned, it's about the people. So one of the first things we did is we got rid of these silos. So instead of having these three different business units, for this pilot project, we got everyone into one team. We got a product owner together and a scrum master. We got some user experience people, Java developers. We got the QA guys in there and the ops guys. And th they were technically in different units at the time, but we made sure they were in the same room working as part of the same team. I say the same room, it's a virtual room. Because as you can see there, we were also spread all around the world. Um, so luckily, roughly within the same time zone. And that is one thing that I found to be a success factor for doing this kind of work is remote working isn't a problem so long as you're all within a couple of hours of each other. Uh, once you start getting out to five, eight hours, then you have issues like, you know, someone asks a question and it's the next business day before they get an answer to it. So that's the people side of it. And so here's the first thing we did with DevOps, uh, getting everything tested. So basically DevOps boils down to two things, is you, you test everything and you automate everything. So we started with the testing. So what I hadn't mentioned earlier is one of the things we didn't really have in our previous process was any kind of culture of automated testing, certainly not from the developer's point of view. So we worked with a tool called Cucumber, which is an open source tool. Most of the things I'm talking about here are open source. And Cucumber works, first of all, with this language called Gherkin. Um, so the QA person works with the product owner and they work on a, you know, a fairly natural language description of the various things that the, the product needs to do. So in this case, you can see the scenario is we want to log on to access someone's user profile. And, and here's what you need to do to log on. So given that you've actually registered at some point, when you try to access your profile, then you should see a login overlay. And then when you log in with the right credentials, you get logged in and you see your profile page. So the idea of that is that that's a, a pretty non-technical explanation that the QA team and the product owner can discuss and agree that that's what they want the system to do. There's no code, no technical stuff involved at this stage at all. It's just a, a, a language-based description of behavior. So when that's agreed, then the QA team go back to the developers, and what they work on is this, and this is where the magic comes in with Cucumber, is for each line that you've got in the Gherkin, you create a method, it can be currently in Ruby or Java, 
Um, it doesn't have to be in the language that the system's written in. This is the language that you're testing in. And as you can see here, when I log in with my valid credentials, so it gets the login name, it gets the password, and then here it's calling Selenium to go to the web page and actually do the login with that username and password. So in this case, we're writing some Java code to run a, a web browser simulator to actually do the thing that that line of Gherkin talks about. So what that gives you is an executable specification, which is a really powerful idea. Basically, you've got the thing that you've agreed with the business you're going to do, and you can end up running that as a piece of code to check that the system does what you expect it to. Now, one of the lessons we learned from this is that the, the cycle time is a critical factor, so how long it takes to run your suite of tests. So what you're looking to do is to minimize the amount of time it takes from a developer committing the code to then getting feedback from the system that that either works or doesn't work. So obviously, in terms of the developer themselves sitting at their desk writing their individual piece of code, they're going to be writing a test that goes on with it, and they're, they're going to get feedback in seconds or minutes at most. But what we're looking for here is before they commit, they want to run a test suite to make sure that they haven't broken anything along the way. And there we're looking to try and get feedback in about 15 minutes or so to a developer. In other words, they can commit their code, start the test running, go and grab a coffee or something, come back, and then they'll get an answer whether it's green or red. Once they're happy with that, then what we want is less than 40 minutes for a full integration suite. So in other words, the point where it spits out the end, you're completely happy to deploy it, you know, it's run all the systems that need to run, and it's not broken anything in the wider landscape. So those targets, when you're starting a project, are quite easy. You've just got a few tests, they run in seconds, it's no problem. But as you build up, we got to a point where we had over 1,000 scenarios, 10,000 test steps, if each of those is taking a second or two to do something in a web browser, that really adds up. Um, so what we found is each test suite, which is running a bunch of tests serially, we split them up and split them up so that each test suite would only take around three minutes. Once it got to longer than that, we'd split it up again, so we're always getting into this kind of two to three minute domain for running a, a test suite. And then with those two to three minute suites, we then run that in parallel on the hardware. So obviously, if you've got a cloud here, that's really helpful. You can just keep on spawning more and more VMs as you need them to make those suites run in parallel and make sure you get to these 15 and 40 minute targets. So that's the technology side. Of course, it is about the people. So what we found was that it was actually a challenge taking a bunch of developers who never really had much experience or enthusiasm for writing automated tests before and getting them to do it. Especially when you've got an existing body of code, the last thing anyone wants to do with this big chunk of code is to go and retrofit a million tests to it. So what we did was to focus not so much on getting every single case possible tested. We focused on making sure that the happy path worked. So in other words, you know, when you log in with the username and password, that works, you do get logged in. We're not going to worry too much about um, you know, whether if you put a password that's 15 lines too long, it causes some stack overflow error. We just want the main working thing to work. Um, so if there's any obvious corner cases a developer can catch at the time, they can test for those as well. But then we still have the QA guys doing their exploratory manual testing, so we're not fully automated yet. What happens is, the, where the magic comes in, is every time the QA team now find a bug, the first responsibility of the developer is to write a test for that bug. So that means that that now goes into the test pool and you've automated that failure. So over time, you get more and more automated testing and the QA team have got less and less work to do because all of this gets automated. Um, even so, it may take a little bit of encouragement to the developers to do this. Um, I should have deleted shouting, really. There wasn't much. So having automated our testing, the next stage is to automate the deployment of this product that we've got that now we're confident to release it because it's passing our tests. So in our case, we used Chef. Now, other tools are available, Salt, Ansible, Puppet. They're all good tools. In our case, we tried Chef first. It worked well for us. So we didn't really have a good reason to go and explore everything else. So I'll talk about Chef here, but these principles apply to any of the other frameworks. 
So well, beforehand, we were tossing this code, the release over the wall to the operations guys. They were looking at their Excel spreadsheet of configuration values. They're looking through their Word document of what to do, how to deploy it. With Chef, instead, that's coded up using a Ruby script. And the, the data is stored in what's called a data bag in Chef. And then you can have a data bag for QA, for development, for production, that stores those values. And they're under version control. So you can actually review configuration before it gets deployed. Um, the manual scripts go away completely. It's automated in Ruby. If you do it well, then you've got this property called idempotence of these recipes written in Ruby. And what that means is if you run the same script multiple times, it just ends up as the same result. So it ends up with you having deployed software with a configured database, configured web server, and so on. Uh, it doesn't change things once they've been done correctly. Um, the other thing that's useful here is deploying to a different pool of servers. So again, the cloud is a good thing. You can just spin up another pool of VMs, deploy the new release to that while the old release is still running. You can run tests on that new release. And once that's all happy, it's all been deployed correctly, it's passing all of the tests, then you can just instruct the load balancer to now start using the new pool. And you actually keep the old pool running for a couple of days as well. Because then if anyone finds a critical bug in the first couple of days of deployment, you just flip the switch on the load balancer and go back to the old pool. That has a really, really good property, which means if you get an alarm call in the middle of the night to say there's a serious problem, the only thing you have to know how to do is to switch the load balancer. The rest of it, you can come in tomorrow morning, have a good night's sleep, and work the problem properly, knowing that the old release is still running. You're not trying to fix bugs in production in the middle of the night, because that is a really bad idea. So that's the process and the technology. Naturally, it's about the people. So you do need to get these skills into your team. Um, so we've got a cross-functional team. We've got ops, developers, QA, everyone working together. Everybody in the team needs to learn about Chef, and they need to learn some Ruby. Not enough to be you know, a wizard programmer, but enough to get by and to be able to see what's happening in a recipe. Um, the ops guys need to be able to learn just enough coding to write some recipes, and they can sit with the developers to help make that happen. Uh, a lot of these things are really good opportunities for pairing and knowledge sharing. So just like the testing was good for QA and developers pairing and QA and the product owner pairing, this is a really good activity for the developers and the ops guys to pair up. So that's the testing. We've done the deployment. That's more or less it, except that what you need to do then is you need to keep evolving. This stuff doesn't stand still. Even on a pilot, you can keep improving and keep improving. So in our case, when we started off you know, back in 2010, a long time ago now, um, so we didn't have to so much request hardware and wait six months. But even so, at the start, if we wanted a new VM, we had to send in a request to the operations team. And it might be a couple of days just to get a virtual machine spun up. Um, that then had to be registered with the Chef server for all of that stuff to work. We had to run the Chef client manually, then check that it looked OK on the machine, and then run Cucumber. And these are all manual things we were doing that were, you know, it was much less complicated than the previous process, but it's still a manual process. So naturally, we, one of our team members wrote a command line script that automated all of this. So given a, a pool of VMs that we could use, this script would allow us to take a bunch of those and say, you know, you're the development web server, you're the development app server, you're the development database, hook them together into a coherent deployment, uh, actually deploy stuff. So this, this script really allowed us to automate what was taking several hours into a few minutes. So finally, in 2010, we got to this point where we really did achieve that vision of the four weekly deployment. Because the QA time and the deployment time were so short, that we're getting a genuine four-week development per four weeks. But even with that command line tool, there was still a major people element. So I mentioned in the earlier slides that we had the, the Scrum Master, we had the product owner. But we were doing Agile as practiced by people who've read about Agile on some websites, um, which we learned was a little bit different to really doing Agile. So it made a big difference to us to actually get some coaching in. Um, people who'd been there, really done it, and, and taught us how to do Agile and Scrum properly. 
Importantly, they weren't afraid to tell people in the team that they were behaving like children, that we all just had to grow up and accept some realities about software development. Um, the other thing we discovered is that within a given team, not everyone necessarily works together in the same way. So no one's at fault, it's just different personalities work together in different ways. So it's useful sometimes just to swap a few people between teams so that you actually get teams who gel and will work together. Uh, what happens then is you get a team that's interested in its own continuous improvement. So you're looking at new tools all of the time. Um, you, these spikes, so you might take in a given sprint, you might take a week for one person to look at a new tool and see if that works out okay. And also at the end of each sprint, you're doing a retrospective. So there, you're not looking so much at what things to develop next. You're looking at how did we do in this last few weeks? Is there anything about how we did it that could be improved? Um, you know, maybe we needed a different collaboration tool. Maybe we need more meetings. Maybe we need fewer meetings. So you talk about these in the retrospective and typically pick the top two or three of those to actually do something about in the next sprint. So you're actually improving how you work as a team at the people level as well as looking at the, the tools and the technology. So we kept improving, and the next year we produced this tool called Barkeeper. So instead of a command line tool, we've now got a web interface. Uh, we're not having to use a pool of virtual machines anymore. We're actually talking directly to the, the vSphere API. Um, and critically, we're running this out now not just for one team. We're expanding this out to the, the whole department that we're in over multiple teams and multiple projects. So we actually introduce a concept of project self-service. So instead of having just one tool running our project for us, this web-based interface allows someone to create a new project and then they can define a landscape, set up the automation, and have their own version of you know, the ID service or whatever project it is they're working on. So this DevOps platform starts to scale throughout the department. So by now, we'd reduced our cycle time to two weeks instead of four. So we had a scheduled deployment every two, every two weeks but we had so much confidence from the automated testing and the automated deployment that even within that two-week cycle, deploying two or three times a week was a relatively common occurrence. Sometimes it would just be we'd find a minor bug with an easy fix, and we'd roll that fix out, it passes all the tests, and we can deploy it within a few minutes. So it really gave us a lot more power, a lot more agility um, in the non-capital A world to respond to business requirements. And of course, with every tool, we need to look at the people impact as well. So in spreading this out to the whole department, uh, we had to talk to different IT teams. Um, this agile coaching, we had to make sure that that program of coaching was rolled out across all of those other teams. And we started to, dis to dissolve these silos. So having ops people embed in, in the development teams became the normal thing to do. So we also encourage regular team learning days as well. So people would uh, have web sessions where if they learn anything particularly cool on their project, they'd share it with everyone else. So everyone piles in and we all learn more from each other and it keeps on improving. And in fact, we improved so much that this got noticed throughout the whole company. So, you know, this is a company of 70, 80,000 people, about half of them are developers. Um, and our little team now we've got responsibility to create this cloud and this DevOps platform for the entire company. So that took us to 2013 where we started another new project, uh, this time called Monsoon. So this is now our cloud and DevOps platform. Um, it's custom developed, we use microservices, Ruby on Rails. The infra infrastructure as a service layer is roughly equivalent to OpenStack at that point. We were aware of OpenStack at the time, but it was never quite mature enough for what we needed at the time that we were doing it. So we ended up building something that looked a lot like OpenStack, uh, that just in our case talked to VMware. Uh, we used Chef as before, and the M Collective is a tool to treat a bunch of machines the same way. So in other words, with M Collective and Chef, we can run Chef on many systems at once just with a single click. Um, we used a tool within Ruby on Rails called VCR, like videotape recorder, uh, to help with uh, microservices testing. So what that allows you to do is to do some testing manually and record the HTTP traffic from your component to the other components. So that then if you want to automate that test in the future, you know that if you talk to another component with X and it returns Y, that it should do that in the future. When VCR does, it's, it sets itself up as a bunch of proxies around your microservice 
So you don't actually need the other services to exist once you've done the recording. It just when it gets X, it returns Y. And that allows you to effectively unit and integration test each microservice without having to have the others present. Um, so yeah, by then, as I say, we're using VMware, we're using F5 load balancers, um, we've got this two-week development cycle, but by now we've actually got continuous integration and testing multiple times per day, and even though the development cycle is two weeks, we actually have every single morning someone gets up a little bit early and physically deploys things by pressing the deploy button. So every single day we're deploying code to production. Of course, once again, there's a people impact to this technology. Um, so at this time, we've grown a bit. So this, uh, this DevOps platform team is now 15 to 20 people, um, two or three people working dedicated on the infrastructure side of it. Interestingly, what you'll see there now is for all of this, we're down to one part-time person for QA. So that tells you how much effort we've saved compared to where we were a few years ago. Uh, we're adopting chat ops now as well, so using IRC quite commonly for people to talk to each other um, to keep real-time information flow between the whole team. Um, because of where we are, we're now restricted, we're just down to UK and Germany for our international operations, but we're still working essentially in remote mode. So even within Germany, some people are working at home, some people working in the office. So we're keeping this idea of a distributed virtual team in roughly the same time zone. Um, having said that, another really important people lesson here is distributed working works very well, but over a period of months, the, the human relationships start to decay. I mean, if you've seen trolling on the internet, that's what happens when you get people who've never met talking to each other. They, they insult pe each other without consequence. Now, we never had anything remotely like that, but it illustrates the point that people have to meet face to face from time to time. Um, once you've met face to face, you get a new level of trust, a new level of efficiency, and that can last for several months. And eventually decays a bit, and you need to get people together just every three to six months. You can have a workshop, that's helpful, but really the important thing is just people sit down and have a meal together and talk as human beings. So what that gave us as a result is, towards the end of last year, we've spread this cloud and DevOps culture throughout the whole company. So now within SAP, we've got hundreds of applications running. A large part of SAP's cloud portfolio is running on this system that we've developed. We've got thousands of developers running it, 10,000s of virtual machines, 10,000s of storage volumes. We're in six regions and 12 availability zones. So that's all looking pretty cool. Um, of course, at this point, you're asking, what's next? And more importantly, what the hell has this got to do with OpenStack? <laughs> so slightly before we get to the OpenStack part, um, we discovered Kubernetes. So a lot of the properties you want of cloud software and, and containerization come with Kubernetes. So you know, you've got this automatic scheduling of containers across a cluster. You've got great self-healing properties. Uh, you can orchestrate rollouts, you know, all of the, I'm not going to go through the laundry list there, but it gives you lots of cool stuff that you really want from a kind of DevOps system that's based on containers. The other thing we have is, this is one of the earlier slides. This sentence here, we have a custom developed cloud automation system with an IaaS layer roughly equivalent to OpenStack. So by 2016, OpenStack has really caught up. We're sitting on a pile of custom-developed code that we're having to keep developing and maintaining that's looking increasingly like what OpenStack does. So what we decided to do is change, you know, throw away the old platform. We're still running it at the moment as a legacy platform, but what we're building at the moment is a containerized version of OpenStack running on Kubernetes. So all of the OpenStack services are running as individual Kubernetes services in containers. Uh, it means we can do constant releases. Um, there's very little op uh, operations overhead. The core OS background to Kubernetes self-updates. Um, so yeah, it, it works very well for us. Um, critical point is in how we've organized our OpenStack system. So over on the right-hand side there, that's our OpenStack. On the left-hand side, 
is the things that OpenStack is managing. So networking, storage, compute resources. And the critical thing here is that we've taken out the, the actual networking part. We don't use the inbuilt parts of Neutron for doing networking within OpenStack. Uh, instead, we use Neutron to control devices from other vendors, uh, most typically Cisco. And there's a, a talk later on in the conference from SAP and Cisco that goes into more detail how we've done that. But the important property of that is if you take all of your cloud out of OpenStack and leave OpenStack in place managing your cloud, then if that blue box goes down, every single customer virtual machine keeps on running. So SAP's cloud portfolio can keep running, our customers can keep using their software, even if OpenStack goes down. That makes it really, really easy to think about upgrading OpenStack because we can actually take down the cluster. You know, we don't even necessarily need to. We can just take down containers, redeploy them, and only suffer a few seconds of outage on the blue part. But if necessary, we can take down the blue side, and the only thing that stops anyone doing is putting new virtual machines in place or using OpenStack to do stuff. But any existing software keeps running. Also, we've got um, analytics and billing on the platform. So we've got Prometheus there sending uh, monitoring events out. We've got Sentry for capturing crash data and feeding that back to developers and getting user feedback. Uh, the ELK stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, that's taking care of all of our logging and log shipping and searching of it. Uh, then we have Manaska taking care of the alerting. Uh, Silometer is busy there collecting all of the events and metrics for billing. And we send all of that data from Silometer through to SAP's HANA in-memory database where it can be analyzed and we can do all of the billing uh, and look at what we need to do to improve the platform from the analysis. So that's just bare OpenStack. Um, what we're also adding into the mix is a couple of tools that were developed called Lyra and Arc. So Arc is an agent that uh, sits on the actual virtual machines themselves and can run tasks, a little bit like M Collective. And Lyra is a high level service that runs uh, alongside other OpenStack services and allows us to schedule automations. So basically we're adding this kind of automation and DevOps module into OpenStack where we can say, we can use Lyra to say, run a bunch of chef recipes on these machines, run a bunch of shell scripts on the other machines, run some Ansible scripts on some other machines. So we're taking these properties that we had on our other platform that was independent of the infrastructure layer and bringing them into OpenStack. So these are under development at the moment. The, the plan is to be open sourcing them um, probably during this year. And the other thing we've introduced on top is a new dashboard for OpenStack called uh, Electra. So Horizon as a dashboard is okay, but it's focused really at very technical administrator types. What we're trying to do with Electra is get across what I mentioned earlier that we had with this project self-service making this something that's much more consumable by a typical developer to be able to set up a project, create a bunch of virtual machines and, and run automations across those machines. Um, and we've got the first few pilot projects using this at the moment, um, trying out our new DevOps platform. So yeah, this is essentially what we've built. So now we've got container-based OpenStack. We're running that across 13 regions tens of data centers, XX is a secret at the moment, exactly how many there are. We have this control plane, uh, which is controlling, um, this is the OpenStack part of it. Control plane, we can get that from a bare metal in a data center to a scaled OpenStack cluster in a matter of hours. So we've actually got, uh, we're applying DevOps to building our DevOps platform. So we can actually get a new data center up and running in hours with automated deployment using all of these same tools. Um, the, the control plane controls our data plane, so we've got a uh, choice of VMware or KVM at the moment. We're looking at adding other cloud providers as well. Um, we can deploy bare metal machines uh, for SAP's HANA database. We can deploy virtual machines. Containers as a service is coming shortly as well. So this then becomes the platform that SAP uses for delivering its, its cloud portfolio and also for supporting internal innovation. So if someone wants to create a new project or a new product, they can use the self-service features here to quickly spin up a few machines, try things out, close them down again, and they're costing a tiny amount of money to their cost center. 
Um, we've got all of the monitoring, logging, alerting, and billing that I showed on the previous slide. We've got the, the automation engine, we've got the dashboard. So we've got this really cool platform, which is the foundation of our future success as a software company. And process-wise, we're building this on a four-week review cycle. So I'm not calling it a sprint anymore. We just get together every four weeks to checkpoint and see what we've done. But we're really continuously bringing in new features and deploying them. We're working more of a Kanban mode of just you know, looking at the number of tickets on the board. When we've done one, pushes off to one side, we pull another one in from the left. Importantly, in all of the previous stuff we were doing, almost everything we were doing was our own code, lived within our own walls. On the new platform, 90% of the code we're producing is open source. The 10% that's not open source, there's no point open sourcing. It's, uh, it's about things like how we do the billing to an SAP cost center. That's, that's not of interest to anyone in the outside world. So the, the SAP specific configuration and some of the SAP specific processes is the 10% that we're developing in house. 90% of what we do is out there on GitHub. Um, and yeah, you can see uh, the projects that we're contributing to. We're contributing to OpenStack itself. We're putting stuff into Kubernetes, into Docker, Grafana, also in, in several of the consumer libraries. So OpenStack for J and Fog, which is the Ruby library, were major contributors in those spaces. Of course, it is about the people, and this is where we're at now. And you can see there, compared to the previous monsoon project, it's not a massive change. It's maybe you know, 30, 40% more people, still only half a person doing QA. Um, we do have more complexity uh, as we grow this platform, as we introduce it to more and more people across the company. So instead of having one person on operations or night call duty, we now have three sub teams. And any point in time, therefore, we've got two people in each sub team. So we've got six people on call for anything that might go wrong. But typically, they're handling tickets during working hours. There's not really any out of hours calls that go to them. Uh, we do have a, a global distributed first level support team that takes care of any out of hours stuff. And we've been learning a lot from how the open source community does things. Um, actually forcing ourselves to put everything on GitHub and work with the OpenStack community is changing how we develop code uh, in many ways for the better. So the fact is, you know, code that may have been good enough before, now when we put it out to the community, it goes through a review process. And it may be a bit annoying. It may take a week or two to get a, a patch set through. But by the time that's done, it comes back as much better code than we would have written in the first place. So the quality of the platform is better for being open source than it would be if we'd written it internally. Uh, highlighted in yellow there, you can see github.com slash SAPCC. That's SAP Converged Cloud. That's the project in GitHub where we're putting all of our open source components. So not, not everything there is necessarily current or finished or rosy, but several of our bits are being worked on live there. Um, other components will be published there throughout the year. So that's the place to keep an eye on for some of the tools like Electra, Lyra, and Arc that you can add to an existing OpenStack deployment to give it DevOps capability. So with that's it. Thank you. A reminder, it's all about the people. You know, there's some really cool tools and technologies. It's really important not to be distracted by that. They help make it work, but it cannot work unless you really focus on your people, on your teams, getting people to work together, work effectively, treating each other as human beings, eating meals together, and improving as a team. So thank you. Any questions? I see what you're saying, yeah. So at that point, they cease to become elastic for the part where, they open, where the control plane is down. But the point is they don't completely disappear. They're not offline. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's an excellent point, yeah. Okay. No more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the summit. <laughs>